The Awakening, The Resurrection, Leo Tolstoy, Part 2, Chapters 9 to 18. After he had finished the instructions, the presiding justice turned to the prisoners. Simon Kartinkin, rise, he said. Simon sprang up nervously. The muscles of his cheeks began to twitch still quicker. What is your name? Simon Petrov Kartinkin, he said quickly, in a sharp voice, evidently prepared for the question. What estate? Peasant. What government, district? Government of Tula, district of Krapivensk, Kupian Township, village of Borki. How old are you? Thirty-four, born in 1800. What faith? Of the Russian Orthodox faith. Are you married? Oh, no. What is your occupation? I was employed in the Hotel Mauritania. Were you ever arrested before? I was never arrested before, because where I lived, you were not arrested. God forbid, never. Have you received a copy of the indictment? Yes. Sit down, Euphemia Ivanovna Bochkova. The presiding justice turned to the next prisoner, but Simon remained standing in front of Bochkova. Kartinkin, sit down. Kartinkin still remained standing. Kartinkin, sit down. But Kartinkin stood still until the usher, his head leaning to the side and with wide open eyes, whispered to him in a tragic tone, Sit down, sit down. Kartinkin sat down as quickly as he rose and wrapping himself in his coat began to move his cheeks. Your name? With a sigh of weariness, the presiding justice turned to the next prisoner without looking at her and consulted a paper before him. He was so accustomed to the business that to expedite matters he could try two cases at once. Bochkova was forty-two years old, a burgess of the town of Coloma, by occupation a servant in the same Hotel Mauritania, was never arrested before and had received a copy of the indictment. She gave the answers very boldly and with an intonation which seemed to add to every answer. Yes, Bochkova, Euphemia, have received a copy, and am proud of it, and will permit no one to laugh at me. Without waiting to be told to sit down, Bochkova sat down immediately after the questioning ceased. Your name? asked the presiding justice of the third prisoner. You must rise, he added gently and courteously, seeing Maslova still in her seat. With quick movement, Maslova rose with an air of submissiveness and, throwing back her shoulders, looked into the face of the presiding justice with her smiling, somewhat squinting black eyes. What are you called? They used to call me Lubka, she answered rapidly. Meanwhile, Nekhludov put on his pince-nez and examined the prisoners while they were questioned. It is impossible he thought, looking intently at the prisoner. But her name is Lubka, he thought, as he heard her answer. The presiding justice was about to continue his interrogation when the member with the eyeglasses, angrily whispering something, stopped him. The presiding justice nodded his assent and turned to the prisoner. You say Lubka, but a different name is entered here. The prisoner was silent. I ask you what is your real name? What name did you receive at baptism? asked the angry member. Formerly I was called Catherine. It is impossible, Nekhludoff continued to repeat, although there was no doubt in his mind now that it was she, that same servant ward with whom he had been in love at one time, yes, in love, real love, and whom in a moment of mental fever he led astray, then abandoned, and to whom he never gave a second thought because the recollection of it was too painful, revealed too manifestly that he, who prided himself of his good breeding, not only did not treat her decently, but basely deceived her. Yes, it was she. He saw plainly the mysterious peculiarity that distinguishes every individual from every other individual. Notwithstanding the unnatural whiteness and fullness of her face, this pleasant peculiarity was in the face, in the lips, in the slightly squinting eyes, and, principally, in the naive, smiling glance, and in the expression of submissiveness, not only in the face, but in the whole figure. You should have said so, again very gently said the presiding justice. What is your patronymic? 
I am illegitimate, said Maslova, but yet you were named after your godfather. Mikhailova. What crime could she have committed? Nekhludoff thought, meanwhile, his breath almost failing him. What is your surname, your family name, continued the presiding justice. Maslova, after my mother. Your estate? Burgess. Of the Orthodox faith? Yes. Your occupation? What was your occupation? Maslova was silent. What was your occupation? repeated the justiciary. You know, said Maslova. She smiled and quickly glanced around, then looked squarely at the justiciary. There was something so unusual in the expression of her face, something so terrible and piteous in the meaning of her words, in that smile, that quick glance which she cast over the courtroom, that the justiciary hung his head, and for a moment there was perfect silence. A burst of laughter from some spectator interrupted the silence. Someone hissed. The justiciary raised his head and continued the interrogation. Were you ever arrested? No, Maslova said in an undertone, sighing. Have you received a copy of the indictment? Yes. Sit down. The prisoner raised her skirt with the customary movement of a fashionable lady, arranging her train, and sat down, folding her hands in the sleeves of her coat, and still looking at the justiciary. Then began the recounting of witnesses, their removal to a separate room, the decision on the evidence of the medical expert. Then the secretary arose and began to read the indictment, loud and with distinctness, but so rapidly that his incorrect sounding of the letters L and R turned his reading into one continuous, weary drone. The judges leaned now on one side, now on the other side of their armchairs, then on the table, and again. On the backs of the chairs, or closed their eyes, or opened them and whispered to each other. One of the gendarmes several times stifled a yawn. The convulsions of Kartinkin's cheeks did not cease. Bochkova sat quietly and erect, now and then scratching with her finger under her cap. Maslova sat motionless, listening to the reading and looking at the clerk. At times she shuddered and made a movement as if desiring to object, blushed, then sighed deeply, changed the position of her hands, glanced around and again looked at the clerk. Nekhludoff sat on the high-backed chair in the front row, second to the aisle, and without removing his pince-nez, looked at Maslova, while his soul was being racked by a fierce and complicated struggle. Chapter 10 The indictment read as follows. On the 17th of January, 18, suddenly died in the Hotel Mauritania, merchant of the Second Guild, Therapont Emelianovich Smelkov. The local police physician certified that the cause of death of said Smelkov was rupture of the heart caused by excessive use of liquor. The body of Smelkov was interred. On the 21st day of January, a townsman and comrade of Smelkov, on returning from St. Petersburg and hearing of the circumstances of his death, declared his suspicion that Smelkov was poisoned with a view of robbing him of the money he carried about his person. This suspicion was confirmed at the preliminary inquest by which it was established. 1. That Smelkov had drawn from the bank, some time before his death, 3,800 roubles, that, after a due and careful inventory of the money of the deceased, only 312 roubles and 16 kopecks were found. 2 that the entire day and evening preceding his death deceased passed in the company of a girl named Lubka, Catherine Maslova, in the Hotel Mauritania, whither said Maslova came at the request of Smelkov for money, that she obtained the money from Smelkov's trunk, first unlocking it with a key entrusted to her by Smelkov, that the money was, thus taken in the presence of two servants of the said hotel, Euphemia Bochkova and Simon Kartinkin, that at the opening of said trunk by the said Maslova in the presence of the aforementioned Bochkova and Kartinkin, there were rolls of hundred rouble bills. 3. That on the return of said Smelkov and Maslova to the said hotel, the said Maslova, on the advice of the said servant Kartinkin, administered to the deceased a glass of brandy, in which she put a white powder given her by said Kartinkin. 4. That on the following morning, Lubka, Catherine Maslova sold to her mistress Rosanova 
a diamond ring belonging to Smelkov, said ring she alleged to have been presented to her by said Smelkov. 5. That the servant of said Hotel Mauritania, Euphemia Bochkova, deposited in her name in the local bank of commerce the sum of 1,800 rubles. At the autopsy held on the body of Smelkov, and after the removal of the intestines, the presence of poison was readily discovered, leaving no doubt that death was caused by poisoning. The prisoners, Maslova, Bochkova and Kartinkin, pleaded not guilty. Maslova declared that she did go to the Hotel Mauritania, as stated, for the purpose of fetching some money for the merchant, and that opening the trunk with the key given to her by the merchant, she took only forty roubles, as she was directed, but took no more, which fact can be substantiated by Bochkova and Kartinkin, in whose presence she took the money and locked the trunk. She further testified that during her second visit to the room of the merchant she gave him, at the instigation of Kartinkin, several powders in a glass of brandy, which she considered to be narcotic, in order that she might get away from him. The ring was presented to her by Smelkov when she cried and was about to leave him after he had beaten her. Euphemia Bochkova testified that she knew nothing about the missing money, never entered the merchant's room, which Lubka herself kept in order, and that if anything was stolen from the merchant, it was done by Lubka when she came to the room for the money. At this point, Maslova shuddered, and with open mouth looked at Bochkova. And when Euphemia Bochkova was shown her bank account of 1,800 rubles, continued the secretary, and asked how she came by the money, she testified that the money was saved from their earnings by herself and Simon Kartinkin, whom she intended to marry. Simon Kartinkin, on his part, at the first examination, confessed that, at the instigation of Maslova, who brought the key to the trunk, he and Bochkova stole the money, which was afterwards divided between the three. At this, Maslova shuddered again, sprang to her feet, turned red in the face, and began to say something, but the usher bade her be quiet. Finally, continued the secretary, Kartinkin also confessed to giving Maslova the powders to put the merchant to sleep. On the second examination, however, he denied having either stolen the money or given Maslova the powders, but charged Maslova with both. As to the money placed by Bochkova in the bank, he declared, in accordance with Bochkova's testimony, that they had saved it during their twelve years' service in the hotel. The indictment wound up as follows. In view of the aforesaid the defendants, Simon Kartinkin, peasant of the village of Borkov, 33 years of age, Burgess Euphemia Ivanova Bochkova, 42 years of age, and Burgess Catherine Maslova, 27 years of age, conspired on the 17th day of January, 188, to administer poison to merchant Smelkov with intent to kill and rob him, and did on said day administer to said Smelkov poison, from which poison the said Smelkov died, and did thereafter rob him of a diamond ring and 2,500 roubles, contrary to the laws in such cases made and provided. Chapter 14, 53, Sections 4 and 5, Penal Code Wherefore, in accordance with Chapter 201 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, the said peasant, Simon Kartinkin, Burgess Euphemia Bochkova and Burgess Catherine Maslova are subject to trial by jury, the case being within the jurisdiction of the circuit court. The clerk, having finished the reading of the long indictment, folded the papers, seated himself at his desk, and began to arrange his long hair. Everyone present gave a sigh of relief, and with the consciousness that the trial had already begun, everything would be cleared up and justice would finally be done leaned back on their chairs. Nekhludoff alone did not experience this feeling. He was absorbed in the horrible thought that the same Maslova, whom he knew as an innocent and beautiful girl ten years ago, could be guilty of such a crime. Chapter 11 When the reading of the indictment was finished, the justiciary, having consulted with his associates, turned to Kartinkin with an expression on his face which plainly betokened confidence in his ability to bring forth all the truth. Simon Kartinkin, he called, leaning to the left. 
Simon Cartinkin rose, put out his chest, incessantly moving his cheeks. You are charged, together with Euphemia Bochkova and Catherine Maslova, with stealing from the trunk of the merchant Smelkov money belonging to him, and subsequently brought arsenic and induced Maslova to administer it to Smelkov, by reason of which he came to his death. Are you guilty or not guilty? he said, leaning to the right. It is impossible, because our business is to attend the guests. You will speak afterwards. Are you guilty or not? No, indeed, I only... You can speak later. Do you admit that you are guilty? Calmly but firmly repeated the justiciary. I cannot do it, because... Again, the usher sprang towards Simon and with a tragic whisper stopped him. The justiciary, with an expression showing that the questioning was at an end, moved the hand in which he held a document to another place and turned to Euphemia Bochkova. Euphemia Bochkova, you, with Kartinkin and Maslova, are charged with stealing on the 17th day of January, 188, at the Hotel Mauritania from the trunk of the merchant Smelkov, money and a ring, and dividing the same among yourselves, and with a view of hiding your crime, administered poison to him from the effects of which he died. Are you guilty? I am not guilty of anything, boldly and firmly answered the prisoner. I never entered the room, and as that scurvy woman did go into the room, she then did the business. You will speak afterwards, again said the justiciary, with the same gentleness and firmness. So you are not guilty? I did not take the money did not give him the poison, did not go into the room. If I were in the room, I should have thrown her out. You are not guilty, then? Never? Very well. Catherine Maslova, began the justiciary, turning to the third prisoner. The charge against you is that, having come to the Hotel Mauritania with the key to Smelkov's trunk, you stole there from money and a ring, he said, like one repeating a lesson learned by rote, and leaning his ear to the associate sitting on his left, who said that he noticed that the file mentioned in the list of exhibits was missing. Stole there from money and a ring, repeated the justiciary, and after dividing the money again, returned with the merchant Smelkov to the Hotel Mauritania, and there administered to him poison from the effects of which he died. Are you guilty or not guilty? I am not guilty of anything, she answered quickly. As I said before, so I repeat now, I never, never, never took the money. I did not take anything, and the ring he gave me himself. You do not plead guilty of stealing twenty-five hundred roubles, said the justiciary. I say I didn't take anything but forty roubles. And do you plead guilty to the charge of giving the merchant Smelkov powders in his wine? To that I plead guilty. Only I thought, as I was told, that they would put him to sleep, and that no harm could come from them. I did not wish, nor thought of doing him any harm. Before God, I say that I did not, she said. So you deny that you are guilty of stealing the money and ring from the merchant Smelkov, said the justiciary. But you admit that you gave him the powders. Of course, I admit, only I thought that they were sleeping powders. I only gave them to him that he might fall asleep, never wished nor thought. Very well, said the justiciary, evidently satisfied with the results of the examinations. Now tell us how it happened, he said, leaning his elbows on the arms of the chair and putting his hands on the table. Tell us everything. By confessing frankly, you will improve your present condition. Maslova, still looking straight at the justiciary, was silent. Tell us what took place. What took place? Suddenly said Maslova. I came to the hotel. I was taken to the room. He was there and was already very drunk. She pronounced the word he with a peculiar expression of horror and with wide open eyes. I wished to depart. He would not let me. She became silent as if she had lost the thread of the story or thought of something else. What then? What then? Then I remained there a while and went home. At this point, the assistant public prosecutor half rose from his seat, uncomfortably resting on one elbow. Do you wish to question the prisoner? asked the justiciary, 
and receiving an affirmative answer, motioned his assent. I would like to put this question. Has the prisoner been acquainted with Simon Kartinkin before? asked the assistant prosecutor without looking at Maslova. And having asked the question, he pressed his lips and frowned. The justiciary repeated the question. Maslova looked with frightened eyes at the prosecutor. With Simon? I was, she said. I would like to know now, what was the character of the acquaintance that existed between them? Have they met often? What acquaintance? He invited me to meet guests. There was no acquaintance, answered Maslova, throwing restless glances now at the prosecutor, now at the justiciary. I would like to know why did Kartinkin invite Maslova only, and not other girls, asked the prosecutor, with a Mephistophelian smile winking his eyes. I don't know. How can I tell? answered Maslova, glancing around her, frightened, and for a moment resting her eyes on Nekhludoff. He invited whomever he wished. Is it possible that she recognised me? Nekhludoff thought with horror. He felt his blood rising to his head, but Maslova did not recognise him. She turned away immediately and with frightened eyes gazed at the prosecutor. Then the prisoner denies that she had intimate relations with Kartinkin. Very well. I have no more questions to ask. He removed his elbow from the desk and began to make notes. In reality, instead of making notes, he merely drew lines across his notes, having seen prosecutors and attorneys, after an adroit question, making memoranda of questions which were to crush their opponents. The justiciary did not turn immediately to the prisoner, because he was at the moment asking his associate in the eyeglasses whether he consented to the questions previously outlined and committed to writing. What followed? the justiciary continued. I came home, Maslova continued, looking somewhat bolder, and went to sleep. As soon as I was asleep, our girl, Bertha, came and woke me. Your merchant is here again. Wake up. Then he, again she pronounced it with evident horror. He wished to send for wine, but was short of money. Then he sent me to the hotel, telling me where the money was and how much to take, and I went. The justiciary was whispering at the time to his associate on the left and did not listen to Maslova, but to make it appear that he had heard everything he repeated her last words. And you went. Well, what else? he asked. I came there and did as he told me. I went to his room. I did not enter it alone, but called Simon Mikhailovich and her, she said, pointing to Bochkova. She lies. I never entered. Bochkova began, but she was stopped. In their presence, I took four ten-rouble bills, she continued. And while taking this money, did the prisoner see how much money there was? asked the prosecutor. Maslova shuddered as soon as the prosecutor began to speak. She could not tell why, but she felt that he was her enemy. I did not count it, but I saw that it was all hundred-rouble bills. The prisoner saw hundred-rouble bills. I have no other questions. Well. Did you bring back the money? asked the justiciary, looking at the clock. I did. Well, what then? Then he again took me with him, said Maslova. And how did you give him the powder in the wine? asked the justiciary. How? Poured it into the wine and gave it to him. Why did you give it to him? Without answering, she sighed deeply. After a short silence, she said, He would not let me go. He exhausted me. I went into the corridor and said to Simon Mikhailovich, If he would only let me go, I am so tired. And Simon Mikhailovich said, We are all so tired of him. We intend to give him sleeping powders. When he is asleep, you can go. All right, I said. I thought that it was a harmless powder. He gave me a package. I entered. He lay behind the partition and ordered me to bring him some brandy. I took from the table a bottle of fine champagne, poured into two glasses, for myself and him, threw the powder into his glass and handed it to him. I would not have given it to him if I had known it. And how did you come by the ring? asked the justiciary. He presented it to me. When did he present it to you? When we reached his room. I wished to depart. Then he struck me on the head and broke my comb. I was angered and wished to go. 
Then he took the ring from his finger and gave it to me, asking me to stay, she said. Here the assistant prosecutor again rose, and with a dissimulating naiveness asked permission to ask a few more questions, which was granted, and leaning his head on his gold-embroidered collar, he asked, I would like to know how long was the prisoner in the room with Smelkov. Maslova was again terror-stricken, and with her frightened eyes wandering from the prosecutor to the justiciary, she answered hurriedly, I do not remember how long. And does the prisoner remember entering another part of the hotel after she had left Smelkov? Maslova was thinking. Into the next room, an empty one, she said. Why did you enter that room? said the assistant prosecutor impulsively. To wait for a cabriolet. Was not Kartinkin in the room with the prisoner? He also came in. Why did he come in? There was the merchant's fiend champagne left, and we drank it together. Oh, drank together. Very well. And did the prisoner have any conversation with Simon, and what was the subject of the conversation? Maslova suddenly frowned, her face turned red, and she quickly answered, what I said. I know nothing more. Do what you please with me. I am innocent, and that is all. I did not say anything. I told everything that happened. I have no more questions to ask, said the prosecutor to the court, and uplifting his shoulders, he began to add to the memorandums of his speech that the prisoner herself confessed to entering an empty room with Simon. There was a short silence. Have you anything else to say? I have told everything, she said, sighing, and took her seat. The justiciary then made some notes, and after he had listened to a suggestion whispered by the associate on the left, declared a recess of ten minutes, and hastily rising, walked out of the courtroom. After the judges had risen, the jury, lawyers, and witness also rose, and with the pleasant feeling of having already performed part of an important work, began to move hither and thither. Nekhludoff walked into the jury room and took a seat near the window. Chapter 12. Yes, it was Katyusha. The relations of Nekhludoff to Katyusha were the following. Nekhludoff first met Katyusha when he went to stay one summer out at the estate of his aunts in order that he might quietly prepare his thesis on the private ownership of land. Ordinarily, he lived on the estate of his mother near Moscow with his mother and sister. But that year, his sister married, and his mother went abroad. Nekhludoff had to write a composition in the course of his university studies and decided to pass the summer at his aunt's. There in the woods, it was quiet, and there was nothing to distract him from his studies. Besides, the aunts loved their nephew and heir, and he loved them, loved their old-fashioned way of living. During that summer, Nekhludoff experienced that exaltation which youth comes to know, not by the teaching of others, but when it naturally begins to recognize the beauty and importance of life and man's serious place in it, when it sees the possibility of infinite perfection of which the world is capable and devotes itself to that endeavor, not only with the hope, but with a full conviction of reaching that perfection which it imagines possible. While in the university, he had that year read Spencer's Social Statics, and Spencer's reasoning bearing on private ownership of land produced a strong impression on him, especially because he was himself the son of a landed proprietress. His father was not rich, but his mother received as her marriage portion 10,000 acres of land. He then for the first time understood all the injustice of private ownership of land, and being one of those to whom any sacrifice in the name of moral duty was a lofty spiritual enjoyment, he forthwith divided the land he had inherited from his father among the peasants. On this subject, he was then composing a disquisition. His life on the estate of his aunts was ordered in the following way. He rose very early, sometimes at three o'clock, until sunrise bathed in the river under a hill, often in the morning mist, and returned when the dew was yet on the grass and flowers. Some mornings he would, after partaking of coffee, sit down to write his composition, or read references bearing on the subject. But above all, he loved to ramble in the woods. Before dinner, he would lie down in the woods and sleep. Then, at dinner, he made merry, jesting with his aunts, then went out riding or rowing. 
In the evening he read again, or joined his aunts, solving riddles for them. On moonlit nights he seldom slept, because of the immense joy of life that pervaded him, and instead of sleeping, he sometimes rambled in the garden till daylight, absorbed in his thoughts and fantasies. Thus he lived happily the first month under the roof of his aunt's dwelling, paying no attention to the half-servant, half-ward, the black-eyed, nimble-footed Katyusha. Nekludov, raised under the protecting wing of his mother, was at nineteen a perfectly innocent youth. He dreamed of woman, but only as wife. All those women who, according to his view, could not be considered as likely to become his wife, were to him not women, but people. But it happened on Ascension Day that there was visiting his aunts a lady from the neighbourhood with her two young daughters, her son, and a local artist who was staying with them. After tea had been served, the entire company, as usual, repaired to the meadow where they played blind man's buff. Katyusha went with them. After some exchanges came Nekludov's turn to run with Katyusha. Nekludov always liked to see Katyusha, but it had never occurred to him that their relations could ever be any but the most formal. It will be difficult to catch them now, said the cheerful artist, whose short and curved legs carried him very swiftly, unless they stumble. You could not catch them. One, two, three! They clapped their hands three times. Almost bursting into laughter, Katyusha quickly changed places with Nekludov, and pressing with her strong, rough little hand, his large hand, she ran to the left, rustling her starched skirt. Nekludov was a swift runner. He wished to outdistance the artist and ran with all his might. As he turned around, he saw the artist catching up with Katyusha, but with her supple limbs she gained on him and ran to the left. In front of them was a patch of lilac bushes, behind which no one ran, but Katyusha, turning toward Nekludov, motioned him with her head to join her there. He understood her and ran behind the bushes, but here was a ditch overgrown with nettles, whose presence was unknown to Nekludov. He stumbled and fell, stinging and wetting his hands in the evening dew that was now falling, but laughing, he straightened himself and ran into the open. Katyusha, her black eyes beaming with joy, ran toward him. They met and caught each other's hands. You were stung by the nettles, I suppose, she said, arranging with her free hand her loosened braid, breathing heavily and looking up into his eyes. I did not know there was a ditch, he said, also smiling and still keeping her hand in his. She advanced a little, and he, without being able to account for it, inclined his face toward hers. She did not draw back. He pressed her hand and kissed her on the lips. She uttered an exclamation, and with a swift movement, releasing her hand, she ran in the direction of the crowd. Plucking two lilac twigs from the lilac bush, fanning her flushed face with them, and glancing around toward him, she ran to the players, briskly waving her hands. From this day on the relations between Nekludov and Katyusha were changed, and there were established between them those peculiar relations which are customary between two innocent young people who are attached to each other. As soon as Katyusha entered the room, or even when Nekludov saw her white apron from afar, everything became immediately as if lit by the sun. Everything became more interesting, more cheerful, more important. Life became more joyful. She experienced the same feeling. But not alone the presence and proximity of Katyusha had such effect upon Nekludov. The very thought of her existence had the same power upon him as that of his had upon her. Whether he received an unpleasant letter from his mother, or was backward in his composition, or felt the ceaseless sadness of youth, it would suffice for him to see her, and his spirit resumed its wonted good cheer. Katyusha had to do all the housework, but she managed to do her duty and found spare time for reading. He gave her the works of Dostoevsky and Turgenev to read, those descriptive of the beauties of nature she liked best. Their conversations were but momentary when they met in the corridor, on the veranda, in the courtyard, or in the room of the aunt's old servant, Matriena Pavlovna, with whom Katyusha roomed, 
or in the servants' chamber, whither Nekhludoff sometimes went to drink tea, and these conversations in the presence of Matryena Pavlovna were the pleasantest. When they were alone, their conversation flagged. Then the eyes would speak something different, more important, than the mouth. The lips were drawn up, they felt uncomfortable, and quickly parted. These relations continued during the time of his first visit to his aunts. The aunts noticed them, were dismayed, and immediately wrote to the Princess Elena Ivanovna, Nekhludoff's mother. But their anxiety was unfounded. Nekhludoff, without knowing it, loved Katyusha, as innocent people love, and this very love was the principal safeguard against either his or her fall. Not only did he not desire to possess her physically, but the very thought of such relation horrified him. There was more reason in the poetical Sofia Ivanovna's fear that Nekhludoff's having fallen in love with a girl might take a notion to marry her without regard to her birth or station. If Nekhludoff were clearly conscious of his love for Katyusha, especially if it were sought to persuade him that he could and must not link his fate to that of the girl, he would very likely have decided in his plumb-line mind that there was no reason why he should not marry her, no matter who she was, provided he loved her. But the aunts did not speak of their fears, and he departed without knowing that he was enamoured of Katyusha. He was certain that his feeling toward Katyusha was but a manifestation of that joy which pervaded his entire being and which was shared by that lovely, cheerful girl. However, when he was taking leave, and Katyusha, standing on the veranda with the aunts, followed him with her black, tearful and somewhat squinting eyes, he felt that he was leaving behind him something beautiful, precious, which would never recur, and he became very sad. Goodbye, Katyusha. I thank you for everything, he said, over the cap of Sofia Ivanovna, and seated himself in the cabriolet. Goodbye, Dmitri Ivanovich she said, in her pleasant, caressing voice, and holding back the tears which filled her eyes, ran into her room, where she could cry freely. Chapter 13 For three years afterward, Nekhludoff did not see Katyusha, but when, as staff officer, he was on his way to his army post, he paid a short visit to his aunts, but an entirely different man. Three years ago, he was an honest, self-denying youth, ready to devote himself to every good cause. Now he was a corrupt and refined egotist, given over to personal enjoyment. Then the world appeared to him as a mystery which he joyfully and enthusiastically tried to solve. Now everything in this world was plain and simple, and was determined by those conditions of life in which he found himself. Then it was necessary and important to hold communion with nature and with those people who lived, thought, and felt before him, philosophers, poets. Now, human institutions were the only things necessary and important, and communion he held with his comrades. Woman, then, appeared to him a mysterious and charming creature. Now, he looked on woman, on every woman, except nearest relations and wives of friends, as a means of gratifying now tried pleasures. Then he needed no money and wanted not a third part what his mother gave him, disclaimed title to his father's land, distributing it among the peasants. Now the fifteen hundred roubles monthly allowance he received from his mother did not suffice for his needs, and he often made it the cause of unpleasant conversation with her. His true self he then considered his spiritual being. Now his healthy, vigorous, animal self was his true ego. And all this terrible transformation took place in him only because he ceased to have faith in himself and began to believe in others. To live according to the faith that was in him was burdensome. Every question would have to be decided almost always against his animal ego, which was seeking light pleasures. But reposing his faith in others, there remained nothing to decide everything having been decided, and decided always against the spiritual and in favour of the animal ego. Besides, following his inner faith, he was always subject to the censure of people. In the other case, he received the approval of the people that surrounded him. 
Thus, when Nekludov was thinking, reading, speaking of God, of truth, of wealth, of poverty, everybody considered it out of place and somewhat queer, while his mother and aunt, with good-natured irony, called him notre cher philosophe. When, however, he was reading novels, relating indecent anecdotes, or seeing droll vaudeville in the French theatre, and afterward merrily repeated them, everybody praised and encouraged him. When he considered it necessary to curtail his needs, wore an old coat and gave it up wine-drinking, everybody considered it eccentric and vain originality. But when he spent large sums in organising a chase, or building an unusual luxurious cabinet, everybody praised his taste and sent him valuable gifts. When he was chaste and wished to preserve his chastity till marriage, his relatives were anxious about his health, and his mother, so far from being mortified, rather rejoiced when she learned that he had become a real man and had enticed the French mistress of some friend of his. As to the Katyusha episode, that the thought might occur to him of marrying her, she could not even think of without horror. Similarly, when Nekludov, on reaching his majority, distributed the estate he inherited from his father among the peasants because he considered the ownership of land unjust, this act of his horrified his mother and relatives who constantly reproached and ridiculed him for it. He was told unceasingly that so far from enriching it only impoverished the peasants who opened three liquor stores and stopped working entirely. When, however, Nekludov joined the guards and spent and gambled away so much money that Elena Ivanovna had to draw from her capital, she scarcely grieved, considering it quite natural and even beneficial to be thus inoculated when young and in good society. Nekludov at first struggled, but the struggle was very hard, for whatever he did, following the faith that was in him, was considered wrong by others, and contrarywise, Whatever he considered wrong was approved of by his relatives. The result was that Nekludov ceased to have faith in himself and began to follow others. At first, this renunciation of self was unpleasant, but it was short-lived, and Nekludov, who now began to smoke and drink wine, soon ceased to experience this unpleasant feeling and was even greatly relieved. Passionate by nature, Nekludov gave himself up entirely to this new life approved of by all those that surrounded him, and completely stifled in himself that voice which demanded something different. It commenced with his removal to St. Petersburg and ended with his entry upon active service. During this period of his life, Nekludov felt the ecstasy of freedom from all those moral impediments which he had formerly placed before himself, and continued in a chronic condition of insane egotism. He was in this condition when, three years afterward, he visited his aunts. Chapter 14 Nekludov called at his aunts because their manor lay on the road through which his regiment had preceded him, and also because they requested him to do so, but principally in order that he might see Katyusha. It may be that in the depth of his soul there was already a mischievous intention toward Katyusha, prompted by his now unbridled animal ego, but he was not aware of it. He merely desired to visit those places in which he lived so happily and see his somewhat queer but amiable and good-natured aunts, who always surrounded the atmosphere around him with love and admiration, and also to see the lovely Katyusha, of whom he had such pleasant recollections. He arrived toward the end of March, on Good Friday, in the season of bad roads, when the rain was falling in torrents and was wet all through and chilled to the marrow of his bones, but courageous and excited as he always felt at that time of the year. I wonder if she is still there, he thought, as he drove into the familiar courtyard of the old manor which was covered with snow that fell from the roofs and was surrounded by a low brick wall. He expected that the ringing of the bell would bring her running to meet him, but on the perron of the servants' quarters appeared two barefooted women with tucked-up skirts, carrying buckets, who were apparently scrubbing floors. She was not on the front perron either. Only Timon, the lackey, came forth in an apron, also apparently occupied with cleaning. Sofia Ivanovna came into the antechamber, attired in a silk dress and cap. 
How glad I am that you came, said Sofia Ivanovna. Mashuka is somewhat ill. We were to church, receiving the sacrament. She is very tired. I congratulate you, Aunt Sonia, said Nekhludoff, kissing the hand of Sofia Ivanovna. Pardon me, I have soiled you. Go to your room. You are wet all through. Oh, what a moustache! Katyusha! Katyusha! Bring him some coffee quickly. All right, responded a familiar, pleasant voice. Nekhludoff's heart fluttered. She is here. To him, it was like the sun rising from behind the clouds, and he cheerfully went with Timon to his old room to change his clothing. Nekhludoff wished to ask Timon about Katyusha. Was she well? How did she fare? Was she not engaged to be married? But Timon was so respectful, and at the same time so rigid. He so strictly insisted on himself pouring the water from the pitcher over Nekhludoff's hands that the latter could not decide to ask him about Katyusha, and only inquired about his grandchildren, about the old stallion, about the watchdog Polkan. They were all well, except Polkan, who had gone mad the previous year. After he had thrown off his wet clothes, and as he was about to dress himself, Nekhludoff heard quick steps and a rapping at the door. He recognised both the steps and the rapping. Only she walked and rapped thus. It was Katyusha, the same Katyusha, only more lovely than before. The naive, smiling, somewhat squinting black eyes still looked up. She wore a clean white apron as before. She brought a perfumed piece of soap, just taken from the wrapper, and two towels, one Russian and the other Turkish. The freshly unpacked soap, the towels and she herself, were all equally clean, fresh, pure and pleasant. The lovely, firm, red lips became creased from unrestrainable happiness at sight of him. How do you do, Dmitri Ivanovich? she said with difficulty, her face becoming flushed. How art? How are you? He did not know whether to thou her or not, and became as red in the face as she was. Are you well? Very well. Your aunt sent you your favourite soap, rose-scented, she said, placing the soap on the table and the towels on the arms of the chair. The gentleman has his own. Timon stood up for the independence of the guest, proudly pointing to the open travelling bag with silver lids, containing a large number of bottles, brushes, perfumes, and all sorts of toilet articles. My thanks to auntie, but how glad I am that I came, said Nekhludoff, feeling the old brightness and emotions recurring to his soul. In answer to this, she only smiled and left the room. The aunts, who always loved Nekhludoff, received him this time with greater joy than usual. Dmitri was going to active service, where he might be wounded or killed. This affected the aunts. Nekhludoff had arranged his trip so that he might spend twenty-four hours with his aunts, but, seeing Katyusha, decided to remain over Easter Sunday, which was two days later, and wired to his friend and commander Shenbok, whom he was to meet at Odessa, to come to his aunts. From the very first day Nekhludoff experienced the old feeling toward Katyusha. Again he could not see without agitation the white apron of Katyusha. He could not listen without joy to her steps her voice, her laugh. He could not, without emotion, look into her black eyes, especially when she smiled. He could not, above all, see, without confusion, how she blushed when they met. He felt that he was in love, but not as formally, when this love was to him a mystery, and he had not the courage to confess it to himself, when he was convinced that one can love only once. Now he loved. Knowingly, rejoiced at it, and confusedly knowing, though he concealed it from himself, what it consisted of, and what might come of it. In Nekhludoff, as in all people, there were two beings, one, spiritual, who sought only such happiness for himself as also benefited others, and the animal being, seeking his own happiness for the sake of which he is willing to sacrifice that of the world. During this period of his insane egotism, called forth by the life in the army and in St. Petersburg, the animal man dominated him and completely suppressed the spiritual man. But, seeing Katyusha, 
and being again imbued with the feelings he formerly experienced toward her, the spiritual man raised his head and began to assert his rights. And during the two days preceding Easter, an incessant struggle was going on within Nekhludoff, of which he was quite unconscious. In the depth of his soul, he knew that he had to depart, that his stay at his aunt's was unnecessary, that nothing good could come of it, but it was so joyous and pleasant that he did not heed it and remained. On the eve of Easter Sunday, the priest and deacon, who, as they afterward related, with difficulty, covered the three miles from the church to the aunt's manor, arrived on a sleigh to perform the morning services. Nekhludoff, with his aunts and the servants, went through the motions, without ceasing to look on Katyusha, who brought a censer and was standing at the door. Then, in the customary fashion, kissed the priest and the aunts, and was about to retire to his room when he heard Matryena Pavlovna, the old servant of Maria Ivanovna, making preparations with Katyusha to go to church and witness the consecration of the paschal bread. I will go there too, he thought. There was no wagon or sleigh road to the church, so Nekhludoff gave command, as he would in his own house, to have a horse saddled, and instead of going to bed, donned a brilliant uniform and tight knee breeches, threw on his military coat, and mounting the snorting and constantly neighing heavy stallion, he drove off to the church in the dark over pools and snow mounds. Chapter 15 that morning service formed the brightest and most impressive reminiscence of Nekhludoff's afterlife. The darkness of the night was only relieved here and there by white patches of snow, and as the stallion, splashing through the mud pools, and his ears pricked up at the sight of the fire pots surrounding the church, entered its enclosure, the service had already begun. The peasants, recognising Maria Ivanovna's nephew, led his horse to the driest spot where he dismounted, then they escorted him to the church filled with a holiday crowd. To the right were the male peasants, old men in homespun coats and bath shoes, and young men in new cloth caftans, bright-coloured belts and boots. To the left, the women with red silk kerchiefs on their heads, shag caftans with bright red sleeves, and blue, green, red striped and dotted skirts and iron-heeled shoes. Behind them stood the more modest women in white kerchiefs and grey caftans and ancient skirts in shoes or bath slippers. Among these and the others were dressed up children with oiled hair. The peasants made the sign of the cross and bowed, dishevelling their hair. The women, especially the old women, gazing with their lustreless eyes on one image, before which candles burned, pressed hard with the tips of their fingers on the kerchief of the forehead, the shoulders and the abdomen, and mumbling something, bent forward standing, or fell on their knees. The children, imitating their elders, prayed fervently when they were looked at. The gold iconostasis was aflame with innumerable candles, which surrounded a large one in the centre, wound in a narrow strip of gilt paper. The church luster was dotted with candles, joyful melodies of volunteer singers with roaring bass and piercing contralto mingled with the chant of the choir. Nekhludoff went forward. In the middle of the church stood the aristocracy, a country squire with his wife and son in a sailor blouse, the commissary of the rural police, a telegraph operator, a merchant in high boots, the local syndic with a medal on his breast, and to the right of the tribune, behind the squire's wife, Matryena Pavlovna, in a lilac-coloured chatoyant dress and white shawl with coloured border, and beside her was Katyusha in a white dress, gathered in folds at the waist, a blue belt and a red bow in her black hair. Everything was solemn, joyous and beautiful, the priest in his bright silver chasuble, dotted with gilt crosses, the deacon, the chanters in holiday surplice of gold and silver, the spruce volunteer singers with oiled hair, the joyous melodies of holiday songs, the ceaseless blessing of the throng by the priests with flower-bedecked turn candles with the constantly repeated exclamations, Christ has risen! Christ has risen! Everything was beautiful, but more beautiful than all was Katyusha, in her white dress, blue belt and red bow in her hair, 
and her eyes radiant with delight. Nekludov felt that she saw him without turning round. He saw it while passing near her to the altar. He had nothing to tell her but tried to think of something and said, when passing her, Auntie said that she would receive the sacrament after Mass. Her young blood, as it always happened when she looked at him, rose to her cheeks, and her black eyes, naively looking up, fixed themselves on Nekludov. I know it, she said, smiling. At that moment, a chanter with a copper coffee pot in his hand passed close to Katyusha, and without looking at her, grazed her with the skirt of the surplice. The chanter, evidently out of respect for Nekludov, wished to sweep around him, and thus it happened that he grazed Katyusha. Nekludov, however, was surprised that the chanter did not understand that everything in the church, and in the whole world for that matter, existed only for Katyusha and that one might spurn the entire world, but must not slight her, because she was the centre of it. It was for her that the gold iconostasis shone brightly, and these candles in the church luster burned. For her were the joyful chants, Be happy, man, it is the Lord's Easter. All the good in the world was for her, and it seemed to him that Katyusha understood that all this was for her. It seemed to Nekludov, when he looked at her erect figure in the white dress with little folds at the waist, and by the expression of her happy face, that the very thing that filled his soul with song also filled hers. In the interval between early and late mass, Nekhludov left the church. The people made way for him and bowed. Some recognised him. Others asked, Who is he? He stopped at the porch. Beggars surrounded him and distributing such change as he had in his pocket, he descended the stairs. The day began to break, but the sun was yet beyond the horizon. The people seated themselves on the grass around the churchyard, but Katyusha remained in the church, and Nekhludov waited on the porch for her appearance. The crowd was still pouring out of the church, their hobnailed shoes clattering against the stone pavement and spread about the cemetery. An old man, confectioner to Maria Ivanovna, stopped Nekhludov and kissed him, and his wife, an old woman with a wrinkled Adam's apple under a silk kerchief, unrolled a yellow saffron egg from her handkerchief and gave it to him. At the same time, a young, smiling and muscular peasant in a new kaftan approached. Christ has risen, he said, with smiling eyes and nearing Nekhludov, spread around him a peculiar, pleasant, peasant odour, and tickling him with his curly beard, three times kissed him on the lips. While Nekhludov was thus exchanging the customary kisses with the peasant, and taking from him a dark brown egg, he noticed the chatoyant dress of Matryena Pavlovna, and the lovely head with the red bow. No sooner did she catch sight of him over the heads of those in front of her, than her face brightened up. On reaching the porch, they also stopped, distributing alms. One of the beggars, with a red, cicatrized slough instead of a nose, approached Katyusha. She produced some coins from her handkerchief, gave them to him, and without the slightest expression of disgust, but on the contrary, her eyes beaming with delight, kissed him three times. While she was thus kissing with the beggar, her eyes met those of Nekhludov, and she seemed to ask him, Is it not right? Is it not proper? Yes, yes, darling, it is right. Everything is beautiful. I love you. As they descended the stairs, he came near her. He did not wish to kiss her, but merely wished to be by her side. Christ has risen, said Matryena Pavlovna, leaning her head forward and smiling. By the intonation of her voice, she seemed to say, All are equal today and wiping her mouth with a bandana handkerchief which she kept under her armpit, she extended her lips. He has risen indeed, answered Nekhludov, and they kissed each other. He turned to look at Katyusha. She flushed, and at the same moment approached him. Christ has risen, Dmitri Ivanovich. He has risen indeed, he said. They kissed each other twice, and seemed to be reflecting whether or not it was necessary to kiss a third time, and having decided, as it were, that it was necessary, they kissed again. Will you go to the priest? asked Nekhludov. No, we will stay here, Dmitri Ivanovich, 
answered Katyusha laboriously, as though after hard, pleasant exertion, breathing with her full breast and looking straight in his eyes, with her submissive, chaste, loving, and slightly squinting eyes. There is a point in the love between man and woman when that love reaches its zenith, when it is free from consciousness, reason, and sensuality. Such a moment arrived for Nekhludoff that Easter morn. Now, whenever he thought of Katyusha, her appearance at that moment obscured every other recollection of her, the dark, smooth, resplendent head, the white dress with folds clinging to her graceful bust and undulating breast, those vermilion cheeks, those brilliant black eyes, and two main traits in all her being, the virgin purity of her love, not only for himself, but for everything and everybody. He knew it, not only the good and beautiful, but even that beggar whom she had kissed. He knew that she possessed that love, because that night and that morning he felt it within him, and felt that in that love his soul mingled into one with hers. Ah, if that feeling had continued unchanged. Yes, that awful affair occurred after that notable commemoration of Christ's resurrection, he thought now, sitting at the window of the jury room. Chapter 16 Returning from the church, Nekhludoff broke his fast with the aunts, and to repair his strength, drank some brandy and wine, a habit he acquired in the army, and going to his room immediately fell asleep with his clothes on. He was awakened by a rap at the door. By the rap he knew that it was she, so he rose, rubbing his eyes and stretching himself. Is it you, Katyusha? Come in, he said, rising. She opened the door. You are wanted to breakfast, she said. She was in the same white dress, but without the bow in her hair. As she looked in his eyes, she brightened up as if she had announced something unusually pleasant. I shall come immediately, he answered, taking a comb to rearrange his hair. She lingered for a moment. He noticed it, and putting down the comb, he moved toward her. But at the same moment, she quickly turned and walked off with her customary light and agile step along the narrow mat of the corridor. What a fool I am! Nekhludoff said to himself. Why did I not detain her? And he ran after her. He did not know himself what he wished of her, but it seemed to him that when she entered his room, he ought to have done something that anyone in his place would have done, but which he failed to do. Wait, Katyusha, he said. She looked around. What is it? she said, stopping. Nothing. I only... With some effort, he overcame his shyness and remembering how people generally act in such a case, he put his arm about Katyusha's waist. She stopped and looked in his eyes. Don't, Ivanovich, don't, she said, blushing until her eyes filled with tears. Then, with her rough, strong hands, she removed his arm. Nekhludoff released her, and for a moment felt not only awkward and ashamed, but seemed odious to himself. He should have believed in himself, but he failed to understand that this awkwardness and shame were the noblest feelings of his soul, begging for recognition, and on the contrary, it seemed to him that it was his foolishness that was speaking within him, that he ought to have done as everybody does in a similar case. He overtook her again, again embraced her, and kissed her on the neck. This kiss was entirely unlike the other two kisses. The first was given unconsciously, behind the lilac bush the second in the morning in church. The last one was terrible, and she felt it. But what are you doing? she exclaimed in such a voice as if he had irrecoverably destroyed something infinitely precious and ran away from him. He went to the dining room. His aunts in holiday attire, the doctor and a neighbour were taking lunch standing. Everything was as usual, but a storm raged in Nekhludoff's soul. He did not understand what was said to him, his answers were inappropriate, and he was thinking only of Katyusha, recalling the sensation of the last kiss he gave her when he overtook her in the corridor. He could think of nothing else. When she entered the room without looking at her, he felt her presence with all his being and had to make an effort not to look at her. After lunch, he went immediately to his room and in great agitation walked to and fro, listening to the sounds in the house and waiting to hear her steps. 
The animal man that dwelled in him not only raised his head, but crushed underfoot the spiritual man that he was when he first arrived at the manor, and was even this very morning in church, and that terrible animal man now held sway in his soul. Although Nekhludoff was watching an opportunity to meet Katyusha that day, he did not succeed in seeing her face to face even once. She was probably avoiding him. But in the evening it happened that she had to enter a room adjoining his. The physician was to remain overnight, and Katyusha had to make the bed for him. Hearing her steps, Nekhludoff, stepping on tiptoe and holding his breath as though preparing to commit a crime, followed her into the room. Thrusting both her hands into a white pillowcase and taking hold of two corners of the pillow, she turned her head and looked at him smiling, but it was not the old, cheerful, happy smile, but a frightened, piteous smile. The smile seemed to tell him that what he was doing was wrong. For a moment he stood still. There was still the possibility of a struggle. Though weak, the voice of his true love to her was still heard. It spoke of her, of her feelings, of her life. The other voice reminded him of his enjoyment, his happiness, and this second voice stifled the first. He approached her with determination, and the terrible, irresistible animal feeling mastered him. Without releasing her from his embrace, Nekhludoff seated her on the bed and feeling that something else ought to be done, seated himself beside her. Dmitri Ivanovich, darling, please let me go, she said in a piteous voice. Matriena Pavlovna is coming, she suddenly exclaimed, tearing herself away. Matriena Pavlovna was really approaching the door. She entered the room, holding a quilt on her arm, and looking reproachfully at Nekhludoff, angrily rebuked Katyusha for taking the wrong quilt. Nekhludoff went out in silence. He was not even ashamed. By the expression of Matriena Pavlovna's face, he saw that she condemned him, and justly so. He knew that what he was doing was wrong, but the animal feeling, which succeeded his former feeling of pure love to her, seized him and held sole sway over him, recognising no other feeling. He knew now what was necessary to do in order to satisfy that feeling and was looking for means to that end. He was out of sorts all that night. Now he would go to his aunt's, now he returned to his room or went to the peron, thinking but of one thing, how to meet her alone. But she avoided him, and Matriena Pavlovna strove not to lose sight of her. Chapter 17 Thus the entire evening passed, and when night came, the doctor went to bed. The aunts were also preparing to retire. Nekhludoff knew that Matriena Pavlovna was in the aunts, dormitory, and that Katyusha was in the servants' quarters, alone. He again went out on the peron. It was dark, damp and warm, and that white mist which in the spring thaws the last snow filled the air. Strange noises came from the river, which was a hundred feet from the house. It was the breaking up of the ice. Nekhludoff came down from the peron, and stepping over pools and the thin ice covering formed on the snow, walked toward the window of the servants' quarters. His heart beat so violently that he could hear it. His breathing at times stopped, at others it escaped in a heavy sigh. A small lamp was burning in the maid servants' room. Katyusha was sitting at the table alone, musing and looking at the wall before her. Without moving, Nekhludoff for some time stood gazing at her, wishing to know what she would do while thinking herself unobserved. For about two minutes she sat motionless, then raised her eyes, smiled, reproachfully shook her head at herself apparently, and changing her position with a start placed both hands on the table and fixed her eyes before her. He remained looking at her and involuntarily listened to the beating of his heart and the strange sounds coming from the river. There, on the misty river, some incessant, slow work was going on. Now something snuffled, then it crackled, and again the thin layer of ice resounded like a mass of crushed glass. He stood looking at the thoughtful face of Katyusha, tormented by an internal struggle, and he pitied her. But strange to say, this pity only increased his longing for her. 
He rapped at the window. She trembled from head to foot, as if an electric current had passed through her, and terror was reflected on her face. Then she sprang up, and going to the window, placed her face against the window pane. The expression of terror did not leave her, even when, shading her eyes with the palms of her hands, she recognized him. Her face was unusually grave. He had never seen such an expression on it. When he smiled, she smiled also. She smiled as if only in submission to him. But in her soul, instead of a smile, there was terror. He motioned her with his hand to come out, but she shook her head and remained at the window. Again, he leaned toward the window and was about to speak when she turned toward the door. Someone had apparently called her. Nekhludoff moved away from the window. The fog was so dense that when five feet away, he saw only a darkening mass from which a red, seemingly large light of the lamp was reflected. From the river came the same strange sounds of snuffling, crackling and grinding of the ice. In the courtyard, a cock crowed. Others nearby responded. Then from the village, first singly, interrupting each other, then mingling into one chorus, was heard the crowing of all the cocks. Except for the noise of the river, it was perfectly quiet all around. After walking twice around the corner of the house and stepping several times into mud pools, Nekhludoff returned to the window of the maidservants' quarters. The lamp was still burning, and Katyusha sat alone at the table as if in indecision. As soon as he came near the window, she looked at him. He rapped. Without stopping to see who had rapped, she immediately ran from the room, and he heard the opening and closing of the door. He was already waiting for her in the passage, and immediately silently embraced her. She pressed against his bosom, lifted her head, and with her lips met his kiss. When Nekhludoff returned to his room, it was getting brighter. Below, the noises on the river increased, and a buzzing was added to the other sounds. The mist began to settle, and from behind the wall of mist, the waning moon appeared, gloomily, lighting up something dark and terrible. Is it good fortune, or a great misfortune, that has happened to me? He asked himself. It is always thus. They all act in that way. And he returned to his room. Chapter 18 on the following day, the brilliant and jovial Shenbok called at the aunts for Nekhludoff and completely charmed them with his elegance, amiability, cheerfulness, liberality, and his love for Dmitri. Though his liberality pleased the aunts, they were somewhat perplexed by the excess to which he carried it. He gave a rouble to a blind beggar. The servants received as tips fifteen roubles, and when Sofia Ivanovna's lapdog, Suzette, hurt her leg so that it bled, he volunteered to bandage it, and without a moment's consideration tore his fine linen handkerchief. Sofia Ivanovna knew that those handkerchiefs were worth fifteen roubles a dozen, and made bandages of it for the dog. The aunts had never seen such men, nor did they know that his debts ran up to two hundred thousand roubles, which, he knew, would never be paid, and that therefore twenty-five roubles more or less made no appreciable difference in his accounts. Shenbok remained but one day, and the following evening departed with Nekhludoff. They could remain no longer, for the time for joining their regiment had arrived. On this last day spent at the aunts, when the events of the preceding evening were fresh in his memory, two antagonistic feelings struggled in Nekhludoff's soul. One was the burning, sensual recollection of love, although it failed to fulfil its promises, and some. Satisfaction of having gained his ends. The other, a consciousness of having committed a wrong, and that that wrong must be righted, not for her sake, but for his own sake. In that condition of insane egotism, Nekhludoff thought only of himself, whether he would be condemned and how far, if his act should be discovered, but never gave a thought to the question, how does she feel about it, and what will become of her? He thought that Shenbok divined his relations to Katyusha, and his ambition was flattered. That's why you so suddenly began to like your aunts, Shenbok said to him, when he saw Katyusha. In your place, I should stay here even longer. She is charming. He also thought that while it was a pity to leave now, without enjoying his love in its fullness, 
the necessity of going was advantageous in that he was able to break the relations which it were difficult to keep up. He further thought it was necessary to give her money, not because she might need it, but because it was customary to do so. So he gave as much money as he thought was proper, considering their respective positions. On the day of his departure after dinner, he waited in the passage until she came by. She flushed as she saw him and wished to pass on, pointing with her eyes to the door of her room, but he detained her. I came to bid you farewell, he said, crumpling an envelope containing a hundred rouble bill. How is... She suspected it, frowned, shook her head and thrust aside his hand. Yes, take it, he murmured, thrusting the envelope in the bosom of her waist, and, as if it had burned his fingers, he ran to his room. For a long time he paced his room to and fro, frowning and even jumping and moaning aloud as if from physical pain as he thought of the scene. But what is to be done? It is always thus. Thus it was with Shenbok and the governess whom he had told about. It was thus with Uncle Gregory, with his father when he lived in the country, and the illegitimate son Mituka, who is still living, was born to him. And if everybody acts thus, Consequently, it ought to be so. Thus he was consoling himself, but he could not be consoled. The recollection of it stung his conscience. In the depth of his soul he knew that his action was so base, abominable and cruel, that with that action upon his conscience, not only would he have no right to condemn others, but he should not be able to look others in the face, to say nothing of considering himself the good, noble, magnanimous man he esteemed himself and he had to esteem himself as such in order to be able to continue to lead a valiant and joyous life. And there was but one way of doing so, and that was not to think of it. This he endeavoured to do. The life into which he had just entered, new scenes, comrades and active service, helped him on. The more he lived, the less he thought of it, and in the end really forgot it entirely. Only once, on his return from active service, when, in the hope of seeing her, he paid a visit to his aunts, he was told that Katyusha, soon after his departure, had left them, that she had given birth to a child, and, as the aunts were informed, had gone to the bad. As he heard it, his heart was oppressed with grief. From the statement of the time when she gave birth to the child, it might be his, and it might not be his. The aunts said that she was vicious, and of a depraved nature, just like her mother. And this opinion of the aunts pleased him, because it excapated him, as it were. At first he intended to find her and the child, but as it pained him very much, and he was ashamed to think of it, he did not make the necessary efforts, and gradually ceased to think of his sin. But now this fortuitous meeting brought everything to his mind, and compelled the acknowledgement of his heartlessness, cruelty and baseness, which made it possible for him to live undisturbed by the sin which lay on his conscience. He was yet far from such acknowledgement, and at this moment was only thinking how to avoid disclosure which might be made by her or her attorney, and thus disgrace him before everybody.